left off. Well, Don, from what you said about uh, the experience and, and being prepared for it, it would seem like one of the most important things that someone should do before they contact you is say, I'm ready to change. Mm -hmm. If they haven't made that commitment, then it's going to be difficult for you to accomplish with them what they can, you could otherwise. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, and to me that even sounds like common sense. It surprises me to even hear that somebody may be that resistance to change, but, but they really are, and I know that. Um, but, and, I, and I do have people that will come to me that maybe their spouse has told them to, like let's say they're coming in to quit smoking, or maybe their spouse has bought it for them for a birthday gift or something. I've seen firsthand that when that person comes in, if they don't really want the change, they can smile and nod and, and even think or act like that they're there for the change, but it, the impact is so insignificant. The success rate is significantly decreased when somebody doesn't want to change or isn't ready for it. So they definitely, it has to come from within them. It can't be, well, so-and-so told me and, and I guess I'm just here because that that's what I'm supposed to be doing. I've seen that even with shooters, you know, well my instructor told me to come. Sometimes if the instructor doesn't get into a little bit more detail, then the person's like, all I know is I'm supposed to be here, but they haven't, they don't really have that internal drive and I've seen them kind of come and go then. And the instructors that work with me uh, themselves as clients, like Wendell and John, when they send me people, they have already let them know, they have a general idea of um, you know, what they're going to be working on, how many sessions, you know, go down, you're going to fly in, you're going to spend a few days with her, she'll probably do you know, one or two appointments each day. Those kinds of things they've already been prepped for and by the time they come, they're ready. And it's been the most awesome group of clients to work with. I'm not even kidding, like my whole career this has been the best guys and, and women to work with because not only have I seen that clay shooters are um, you know, kind of warm, giving, kind kind of people as far as they all want to see each other succeed, they, they want to tell their friends about what's going to work for them and what is working for them. Um, it, the instructors at the professional competitive level want to see their students succeed. So they're willingly referring them and, and like I said, because they've been prepped a little bit, they come in really ready. And, the success rate's been huge. So if my wife talked me into coming to see you so you could get me to really want to quit shooting and stay <laughs> home and save the money, you would see right through that and we could move on to other things that would be more productive for yeah, shooting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would, bore, I would more be looking to help you to make sure that you really like shooting and if you really do, then how to stand up to your wife. <laughs> <laughs> I think we might have better luck if I sent my <laughs> wife to you. But anyway, uh, if someone wanted to get a hold of you, Don, how do they do it? Well, uh, my website, dongrant.com, has lots of information, but it always has you know, the contact page with my email, which is dawn at dongrant.com. Uh, my work phone number is on there as well, so those would be the, the best two ways. I, I wanted to say really quick about wives, though. <laughs> Wives love when their husbands come to see me <laughs> because this is the great thing. You can't, there's not like a separate brain, a separate mind for shooting. So everything I teach and everything I instruct and coach on and help clients with, they, their homework is to apply it to everything in life. So let's say I'm helping a client to be more present more focused as an athlete would say and an athlete needs to be more focused because he knows that when he's really focused completely on that target and he's in the zone he's smoking it right his performance increases significantly when he's present focused confident feeling good all this positive stuff well there's no better place to perfect in that than who you spend most of your time with <laughs> so for a client to practice being that present with their spouse and to work on not being so upset, which equates in shooting to, I've just missed all those targets and now I've got to be able to be calm and, and apply some of the mental skills I'm learning and not freak out and not get over worked up about this because it's going to carry on into another station. That equates over here to life of this didn't work out the way that I would have liked 
and how am I going to not freak out about it and how am I going to still stay calm and how am I going to move on from this and really learn from it and, and be better at it the next time around. So uh, our partners is the be are the best people to work on that with. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it, shooters. That segment will be edited into a single clip that will be available for 1995 that you can play repeatedly to your wife so you can arrange to come down and see Grant. Uh, Don, I want to thank you for taking the time today, and I think shooters would really be interested in, in getting a better feel for, for what goes on with the mental training. Uh, and I would assume that you would guarantee everybody there is something there for you to work with. Oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Whether it's going into an event, going into a station or a peg, or leaving, you know, how we leave that station or peg, how we leave the event, all that, there's mental mush happening all over the place. It's hard to do anything without thinking about it. Huh? Yes. Yeah. You, got, you got your brain with you everywhere you go. <laughs> it's been great, Don. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's good. Good. Awesome. So how'd they...
build my confidence instead of decrease confidence. And I know that sounds crazy, but it actually is comes to stop thinking about what you did wrong all the time and think about what you did right. And even in the bad shots, there's always something there to learn, and it actually then becomes a good shot. Does anybody have any questions about that?
probably have better luck with people under 60 if that's the case. Because <laughs> once you get 60, if you relax, you go ahead and fall asleep. <laughs> I had a roof for a month, so it was in the middle of summer in Northeast Florida, so it was in the middle of summer, so I had 100 degrees outside, and I had a roof for a So you'll see your unconscious mind's focused on what I'm saying, or it's over here thinking about 
hear, just be present and not react and listen to everything that is being seen often. Sorry. So I almost never tell the truth. It's, it's so so long as possible, it loves drama, right? Yeah. It loves drama. I think of like days of our lives and uh, <laughs> whatever. It's like different channels. You know, your mind, like if you're trying to fall asleep at night, it flips through the channel in your mind with the different dramas that you've got going on in your life. So there's two main problems. One with the conscious mind. One is that it just doesn't stay present. So we there in the future or whatever. And the other is that just kind of shadow gleam over everything. It's this dreary, gloomy look over everything. You know, as we had a client about a year ago, forgot his gun when he went overseas. So, um, you know, how he looked at that and how much he chewed himself out about it would be the ego and all the negative gray stuff coming in with that. But another way to look like, there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. So, uh, having a full out emotional reaction to it serves nobody well. It's definitely not going to serve your performance well. So, to be able to look at things without the drama. How does the ego of the confidence is different? How does, how does, how does having confidence and having ego uh, at the same time? And how is that? Uh, so, in other words, you know. Confidence is good, okay, but ego is bad. But but how can you handle one without the other? Thank you. <laughs> is he an audience for you? He is stage. You know, I a good five years ago or something, I had a PGA golfer that threw me off with that question because he was like, come on, I don't want to be in the top ten. I don't want to win because there are a bunch of arrogant asses there. You know, he was like,
But I mean, it's doing exactly what you're talking about. It is, and that's what's pretty cool about it. There's a lot of sources that are saying the same
here and just be present and not react and listen to everything that it takes you all day. Sorry. So I almost never tell the truth. It's, it's so so honest possibly it loves drama, right? Yeah. It loves drama. I think of like days of our lives and uh, whatever. <laughs> it's like different channels. You know, your mind, like if you're trying to fall asleep at night, it flips through the channel in your mind of the different dramas that you've got going on in your life. So there's two main problems. One with the conscious mind. One is that it just doesn't stay present. It's always there in the future or whatever. And the other is that this kind of shadow gleam over everything. It's this dreary, gloomy look over everything. You know, as we had a client about a year ago, forgot his gun and he went overseas. So, um, you know, how he looked at that and how much he chewed himself out about it would be the ego and all the negative <clears throat> gray stuff coming into that. But another way to look like there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. So the, having a full-out emotional reaction to it serves nobody well. It's definitely not going to serve your performance well. So to be able to look at things without the drama. How does the ego and the confidence is different? How does how does how does having confidence and having ego at the same time? And how is that? Um, so in other words, you know. You know, confidence is good, okay, but ego is bad. But, but how can you handle one without the other? Thank you. <laughs> is he an audience player? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> Second, 
continued response to an AAD meeting sounds like you're talking about alcoholics anonymous or the 12-step program. Getting in the present, uh, <coughs> you know, letting go of yesterday, not thinking about it, you know, I mean, the whole sort of things that get talked about. Well, okay. Okay. We can all get that training. Well, Don, a lot of people don't really understand mental training, uh, the benefits from it, which I assume are going to be far greater than just in shooting performance, but would contribute in other aspects of life. But I'm really curious, when did you decide in life that you wanted to spend your work days in other people's heads? <laughs> you know, I, at a young age, and as a teenager, I knew I wanted to help people. I didn't really know how I was going to do it. I, I even thought I was going to work with children. So I looked at being a teacher and children's case manager and stuff like that. So I just, I knew early on, and I ended up, when I went to college to get a degree, I got a degree in psychology. Well, now that you're working with shooters, they're a lot like big kids anyway. So you're, yes. st you're still right in that same framework <laughs> in life. 
Uh, now you've worked a lot with golfers. Uh-huh. How did, how did that evolve? Are you a golfer? Um, actually, it seems like the more athletes I work with, the more I become an athlete because they all want me to see how to do it and they want to give me instruction and some of them then end up bartering with me. <laughs> so I end up with all this instruction time. But that's really all that um, I, uh, that's the only golfer in me is that I've had lots of instruction and time out there. And, um, and, and, you know, the, the clients that I worked with with mental training went out there and shot some golf with them. So you're going to stay in the work you're in rather than looking at the LPGA in a yes, couple of years? Yes, yes, no. Nobody has anything to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't have that, that drive in me to want to get out there and perform like that and compete. Well, and I would imagine after you see what it does to everybody <laughs> else, you wouldn't volunteer for it. Um, how did you start working with athletes? What was well, the evolution? Because I'm going to assume they don't give you a specific program for that in college. You come no. out and kind of fall into the niche. I do believe there's some courses for that, but I didn't, that wasn't my intention, you know, setting forth on this journey. I um, was doing mental training in hypnotherapy and as a private practice. Um, I started that. Um, oh. Just the typical. Right. Right, so in 2001, I opened up a private practice, and because it was hypnotherapy, I was helping people with like smoking cessation, weight loss, anxieties, fear of flying, fear of bridges, nail biting, like any kind of habit, sleep problems, um, any kind of habit. And what I think is really cool about that is that over time, um, I became really well versed at the subconscious level of the mind, the conscious level of the mind. Um, but also anxiety, stress, what causes it, and all of that easily translated over into sports. So, so what had happened was um, I was traveling and doing like motivational speaking and I was invited to an event where they had flown in a massage therapist and he just so happened to be Phil Mickelson's massage therapist and he had already been on tour with the PGA for several years and had several dozen um, pro golfers that he worked with on a regular basis. And when he heard me speaking and he, and he was doing a massage for a lot of the executives, they were mentioning my work and he was like, I've got a bunch of people that you need to meet. And so that's what had happened. He introduced me out there on the PGA. Now you mentioned the mental training and hypnotherapy mm -hmm. in the same sentence. Yeah. So I'm a little slow on the uptake, but I think they might be related. How do they intertwine? I actually came up with the word mental training to explain the, the coaching aspect of what I do, the, the instruction side of it. Um, and that was after about five, six, seven years of doing the hypnotherapy, I started to realize that people are kind of their own worst enemy. You know, and, and it's not really their own fault because nobody's taught them anything about their mind. Nobody's taught them anything about their thoughts. Nobody's taught them how even if with the best of intentions, they're probably having some negative expectations. Like if somebody wants to lose weight, it's pretty likely they're looking in the mirror and they're telling themselves, I'm fat. Or they're saying, I'll probably never lose more than 10 pounds. Or this is what happens when you reach this age. You know? And so they're their own worst enemies. And so I decided that I need to teach people about their mind. They'd be much more successful if they understood how they can set themselves up for success and how they can really purposefully stop the things that are causing their problems and their limitations. So that's when I started doing what I called mental training along with the hypnotherapy. A lot of shooters seem to be afraid of success. Do you find that carries across into a lot of other aspects in people's lives? Well, even on the tour, on the PJ tour, I, here I was working with pros that would say, I don't really want to be in the top 10. I don't really want to be winning all the time. And you know, in the back of their mind, they're thinking, I know that that's probably holding me back when I'm out there performing. And the reason for that was their fears about what it would mean, about how much it would change their life, um, what, you know, that they might become arrogant and cocky and um, they, would, they would lose their freedom and their ability to um, you know, go out in public as easily and, and how it would affect their life and all those things that were going on in, in their head. But um, most people, I would say, have more fear 
than, than anything else it is the biggest problem. It's it, what creates like doom and gloom in our life. We fear our decisions. We fear uh, if we've made a good decision, we, we fear heartache and we fear, um, you know, if I go out there and try, I might look like a fool. I, there are fears all over the place. And uh, if anything, that is the main thing that I end up having to help people with because everything funnels back to it. So could I maybe fairly condense that and say we're more comfortable with our failures than we are with the possibility of success? There's a great quote by Marianne Williamson that says that exact thing. And it's actually on my Facebook page right now. <laughs> I haven't it's, read either one, so that just tells yeah, you how Our greatest how fear is am. what we're capable of mm -hmm. rather than um, you know, fear itself. Or what someone says about mm -hmm. our efforts. Yeah. Okay, so here I, I come into your office, I make the appointment. Uh, mental training would be tough with me because there's not a lot to work with. But <laughs> what do I expect when I come in? Because I think people just, it's, it's new in the sport and people don't have an understanding of what the program really is. So kind of give me the, the outline, if you will. And I hate to say typical because while some things are typical about people, each circumstance is individual. What would you do with me? Well, I first would make sure you understood what hypnosis was and what it wasn't because we can't really go much further without that being out of the way and there's so many misconceptions about hypnosis there's just tons but and it's kind of sad because it's a very powerful tool and it's very natural so the main thing to know about hypnosis is you pass through it every single time you fall asleep and every time you wake up like literally so if this is waking state and this is sleep the process of falling asleep, the process of relaxation is what we call hypnosis and you pass through that again when you wake up. So what happens in that state is, it, so over here when you're in waking state we have this chatterbox that just keeps you know, analyzing, it has all these fears, I can't do that, I can't lose this weight, I shouldn't be at this competition, what am I thinking, I'm never going to break 90. You know, All of that chatter is what keeps us from going to sleep at night, right? If you're overanalyzing your work, your budget, your life, your relationships, your profession, <laughs> you are a pain in the butt. I'm gonna come in with that. Awesome, right, I feel like my face is flush from laughing. There's training for that. <laughs> that's, that's right, with the white lights, it'll put a little more color in your face because they're stealing it all away from okay. you. <laughs> Um, so this chatterbox, we're really familiar with it because it keeps us awake at night. Like if somebody came to me with sleep problems, 90% of the time this stinker is what is the problem, right? And it keeps spinning and spinning and spinning and thinking about things. It's like a broken record. Mm -hmm. Well, it keeps you from falling asleep. Well, if somebody's looking to do hypnosis meditation or anything like that, stress reduction classes, workshops, um, sleep workshops that are going to take more of a, uh, a natural approach, they're going to teach people relaxation techniques. <laughs> so to be able to get out of this chatter and go into this space here is obviously really beneficial to fall asleep. Well, what I find, what what I found, and what I would say is very different from other sports psychologists or mental trainers for sports performance, is this understanding of hypnosis and this understanding of this chatterbox, this understanding of what you're able to do at this space, which is accessing your subconscious. All shooters know that this is the same stinker that causes them problems. When they go out there and they're going into an event, it could be the week before the event, it can even be a year before an event, there's thoughts going on and fear, right? Uh, if it's the night before, the morning of, or arriving at the event and actually seeing it. This little guy is causing some problems. Uh, I can't do this. Uh, why do I even bother being here? Um, oh, there's, there's my arch enemy. You know, there's the one that always beats me or that I got in disagreement with the last time. Uh, why did this trap setter set these traps this way? This is foolish. You know, I'm facing the sun and he should know better. Um, why did I get squatted up with these people? They don't stop talking and this husband keeps helping his wife and that's really aggravating me and all of that is this guy. And there's tons of fear behind all of those kinds of thoughts and comments and every single one of them keeps the person out of this more relaxed state. And all shooters know that they perform better in this relaxed state. 
and we call that being in the zone. Mm -hmm. So when somebody's in the zone, they don't have all this chatter going on. They are completely present, they're calm and relaxed, but yet alert. And that's identical to what I'm able to help people to learn how to do and how to be, but not just you know every once in a while when they're doing hypnosis. All of that is translated and brought into their life and their shooting. If I went to the doctor, if he gave me a prescription, it'd be good for 30 days and I'd be cured. If I come to you, what would a, the average person expect as far as a program to get them from where they start to where they'd like to be? Well, let me start with a lot, a lot of people come to me and they think, ooh, hypnosis, you know, it's going to be this little magic wand and I'll forever be fixed, you know, so they think they're going to come in for one or two sessions. Um, hypnosis is really powerful. I've seen it make profound changes in people's life if they're ready for that change and if they're obviously open to hypnosis. Like if they come in and they're thinking, oh, no, this is kind of spooky. I'm not quite sure if, if I want to be hypnotized. Their guard will be up. They won't relax then into the, that powerful state where we can do some good work. If they don't really want the change, they're not going to um, be receptive. They're not going to let their guard down and, and relax. So um, depending on the degree that a person is receptive or not or, or wanting the change, that uh, creates a variation in how many sessions they're going to have. You know, if it takes me two, three, four sessions to get them to be more comfortable, to start opening up, to feel like, yeah, I could see that I need to make some changes there, or to even be receptive to hypnosis, um, that, that's variable. Um, I have every single one of my clients doing self-hypnosis at home so that they can become more and more familiar with it and more and more comfortable and obviously then let their guard down when we really want to do some good work. Um, there's also suggestions that can be given to them through the hypnosis audios that either, you know, that I might record from their session or that they can buy from my website. Um, but on top of that, because like I said already, as I already mentioned, I do the mental training. To me, that's a process. Uh, our habits uh, and our way that we think have created belief systems. We, we think about situations in a certain way by default. They're not any different than any other habits that we have. So our thoughts, we have thought patterns that are habits. We have belief systems that we react to without even thinking about and without even pausing. All of that, if they're problematic, if they're limiting, if they are causing a problem with the shooting from like this chatterbox, those, every one of them are habits that need to be reversed. And I have to be able to teach people how to do that and to increase their awareness over and over again of their own stumbling blocks, their, their own uh, limitations. Then the other aspect that I coach people in is how to be more present because that's another aspect of the zone. And if I was to summarize what I'm doing with athletes, it's to learn how to be, not only learn, but to actually experience being in the zone for longer periods of time and more often. I've seen shooters just with physical skills uh, really resist the magic word change. And it sounds like you're saying a lot of that here with the mental training is that if you're not ready to change, you won't get the benefit from it. Mm -hmm. So 